So this huge alligator jaw is developed. And I said back in September, when the blue line was not at the absolute low, but one of the lows before, and the red line was at the new high, I said, there's no way this can continue. If the blue line takes out its lows, the red line is doomed, and it's going to go with it. And of course, that's exactly what happened. So now the red line has been dropping more than the blue line, which means the S&P 500 is doing worse than the emerging markets. You can see that on the black line at the bottom. That's the relative performance, one divided by the other. When the black line's going up, the S&P is outperforming emerging markets. When the black line's going down, emerging markets are outperforming the S&P. We can see there was a persistent uptrend of the black line from 2013. Uh, there was, a, there was a, 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 a setback in 2017, emerging did better. And then 2018, it was, it was wildly better. And now the black line is going down. So emerging markets in the decline have been outperforming the S&P 500. That's interesting, because typically, when the markets go south, emerging markets get hammered. They're, they're terrible performers. But this time, they're performing better. And it's even stranger that they're performing better in a down market, because the dollar has been going up. One of the strongest correlations in financial markets is when the dollar goes up, emerging markets underperform. And when the dollar goes down, emerging markets outperform, generally speaking. It's a very tight connection. It's not, what's happened is the S&P blue line going down means the S&P is underperforming emerging markets, and yet the dollar, the red line, until recently, has been rising. That's interesting, because it suggests there's some sort of action going on that is probably a tailwind for the emerging markets. So I believe emerging markets are a pretty decent investment particularly because I think the dollar is going to go down. I'll explain why, and, there'll be, and then uh, I'll talk about the national debt, and that'll be the end of my talk. One thing that's also fascinating is emerging, this is the emerging market index versus all the other stocks in the world. So when the blue line is going down, the, the emerging markets are outperforming all the stocks in the world, underperforming. When the blue line goes up, emerging markets outperform. We put in a double bottom. We've even slightly went to a new low. Uh, here in 2018, but it couldn't hold for more than a minute, and now emerging markets are outperforming the rest of the world. If you're a technician, this chart is something you would fall in love with. This is as good as it gets. The only thing that needs to happen to have a full-on green light is you need the downtrend, connect the two peaks, to be broken, and that would come in around 0 0.65. We're at, I think we're at 0 0.635 today. Uh, the emerging markets, again, outperformed today you know, in what was a good market. Now, why do I think that the dollar is going down? First of all, the dollar moves in very long cycles, six to eight years, and the dollar peaked January of 2017. So it's very likely, based upon cycle work, that the dollar is in for some sort of a, a, a longer term underperformance. The best way of thinking about with the dollar is what are the expectations for the Fed? not in the next six months. This is the mistake that so many people in financial media make. They say, oh, well, the dollar's got to be strong because the Fed's tightening and the ECB and Japan aren't, so obviously the dollar's to go up. What's obvious is obviously priced in. So the fact that the Fed was more likely to raise rates in present moments is already known. And we've done a lot of work at Double Line. What really matters is not what the Fed's going to do relativistically in the next six months. It's more like 12 months to 24 months. The correlation is very high. If, if the Fed is perceived to be uh, too optimistic in their ability to raise rates and the bond market says so, then usually the dollar will get weaker in the future. So here's that, what that looks like more recently. The left panel was the bond market's view of how many times the Fed would raise interest rates in 2018. That's the blue line. And you, you determine that by comparing the short-term maturities on uh, treasury bills and short-term notes. So they start guessing about where the Fed funds rate will be at the end of 2018, way back in January of 16. So well in advance. And it started out with the Fed feeling all courageous. They were The black lines are the, what the Fed says based upon their communications, what they think the interest rate will be at the end of some future periods. It's kind of laughable, because they don't even know what it's going to be in six months, and they have the audacity to say, we're going to give you a prediction for, four, for three years from now. It's ridiculous. But they, they do it at their peril, but they continue to make that, that same um, credibility uh, minimization exercise. So they were at four, and the bond market said, I don't believe you for a minute. We think it's going to be one. 
But then the Fed weirdly capitulated to three as the step function on the black. And weirdly, the bond market actually started to get more in sync with the Fed. They went up to two. So there was only a disagreement of one interest rate uh, hike. And then some uh, weakness came in and the bond market went down to only one half of one rate hike. And the Fed was still up at three. And this time, the Fed won. Bond market had to capitulate by the time you got to 2018. Indeed, it was three hikes. This, the next one is for 2019. The, the labeling's wrong down at the bottom. I think someone just copied it over. That's actually 2019, and it, it does begin um, 117. It, well, that's, that's because that's where we are now, I see. So it's, that's why it says 18. It's not, not mislabeled. I'm just thinking of it wrong. Anyway, back in January of 17, the Fed said three times for 2019. The bond market said, I don't believe it. It's one. And the Fed finally dropped it to two in mid-year, then raised it back up to three when they thought growth was really strong and the stock market was booming in the United States, heroically ignoring the fact that world stock markets were already collapsing. So, so the Fed said, we're going to do it three times in 2019. And then the bond market started to believe them. They ratcheted up to two. And then December happened. And the stock market dropped. And, J and Jay Powell had the meeting in December. And he did fine until he did the press conference. And he totally bombed at the press conference. It was a complete disaster. He actually said, this quantitative tightening, this, this uh, 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 headwind for our economy, we're going to do it, you know, damn the torpedoes. We're on autopilot. We're just going to keep doing it. And the market dropped like 800 points in half an hour because they don't like the idea that he's so rigid. Jay Powell was supposed to be a breath of fresh air. He was supposed to be not so uh, academic, not so model-driven. He was supposed to be pragmatic. He was pragmatic Powell. Well, after the market threw a fit, you'll see that what the bond market decided. The bond market decided, ha, with quantitative tightening, the economy's going to tank. Actually, this isn't even updated. This is now at zero as of today. Zero. Bond market says there will be zero rate hikes in 2019. The Fed is still out there talking about two. So there's a room for the Fed to have to capitulate. And when they do, the dollar will get weak. Because that's uh, now for 2020, I didn't put the graphic on. For 2020, the bond market says the Fed is going to cut interest rates, cut them. So there's tons of room for the Fed's rhetoric to end up being too hawkish, leading to a weaker dollar. And it's, there's every possibility that the autopilot easing campaigns of the ECB could one day change. So there's lots of ways for the dollar to go down based on this metric. Also, the dollar is uh, extremely. Uh, uh, overbought. I didn't include the slide, but the bullish long positioning is at a record level similar to the peak of January 17. Also, the dollar is extremely uh, sensitive to growing budget and trade deficits. When the deficits grow, there's a very strong likelihood, based on historical patterns, that the dollar will go down. So I think the dollar is going to go down, and that should lead to further fuel for at least relative performance of emerging markets. I'm not saying they're going to go up, because I'm not really sure that there's, there's wherewithal for the stock market to go up. It might zigzag. It'll probably be strong earlier in the year. It already has been. But rising interest rates, I think, will cause the same trouble at the long end, 10-year and 30-year bonds, as they did in October, when they basically kneecapped the stock market when the long bond got up to near 350. And I think it's going to go there again. And I'll explain why in a moment. So deficits are growing like a weed. And they're growing like a weed at a time when exactly the opposite is traditionally supposed to happen. Deficits grow as the government stimulates to get us out of a bad economy. Deficits are supposed to shrink like a rainy day fund being accumulated when the economy is strong. That you save it so that when something bad happens, you have a rainy day fund that you can run a deficit and you can end up being counter-cyclical in your um, uh, fiscal policy. However, Thanks to this strange situation that we're in politically, we have a rising deficit at a very high clip while the economy is booming. I know that Larry Kudlow and the president say it's the greatest economy of all time, so easily disprovable. But it is not bad, at least by the statistics put out in the GDP. However, the deficit is growing like crazy. The blue line, the blue bars are the deficit. And it's been growing now for three, three years sequentially, having settled in back in the pre-2015 period. What is the dark blue line? That's what we're actually, actually borrowing. The light blue line is the deficit. That's what they report. But they're lying to you. They don't include things that they call off-budget. 
for example, disaster aid that comes from the federal government for a flood or fires, they don't count that the billions that spent on that, the billions that are spent on non-recurring uh, military operations, yet they recur and recur and recur, those aren't counted. So we're actually, for fiscal 2018, which ended September 30th, the official deficit was around $800 billion. That's pretty bad, that's pretty bad. It's almost 4% of the GDP, which is like banana republic type stuff. In Europe, Italy submitted a budget that showed a 2.4 deficit, and they got yelled at from Brussels because that's supposed to be too high for the rules of the ECB. We're running four on the government's own numbers. However, the national debt in the uh, fiscal 2018, ending September 30th, went up by $1.27 trillion, fully 50% higher than the stated deficit. And in fact, for the last five years, the national debt has increased at a rate that's 48% higher than the national debt, than the, than the deficit. In the five years prior, the national debt also grew, because it always does, more than the deficit, but it was only 18%, so it's accelerated. In the last three months, the first full quarter of fiscal 19, the national debt increased by 432, 462 or $82 uh, billion. The annualized increase was $1.832 trillion in a strong economy. That's 8.8% of GDP that this deficit is expanding at. So that's bad. Look at what, and that's bad for the dollar. L look at what happened for the credit crisis. See that blue line that was household debt. It exploded after the OOs. It went from about 60% to 100% of GDP, a 40% increase, and that ended up ending in ruin as there were so many consumer defaults. That's why the Fed had to come to the rescue and, and do zero interest rates and all this quantitative easing. But while they were doing the quantitative easing, look what happened to the black dotted line, which is government debt. It went up from the bottom in 09 from about 40% to 90%. It increased by 50 percentage points, and it, it gets worse. Well, forget Bitcoin. <laughs> it gets, it, it gets, I don't think I included the slide. Okay, I'll just say it verbally. The, the CBO, we're not talking about some shadow economist conspiracy theorist. We're talking about a government bureau, the CBO, that has forecasts on the future of finance for the government. We are now spending 1.25% of GDP on interest expense for our debt. The CBO says that by the mid-2020s, and that used to sound like a long way away, 2020s, but look at the calendar, 2020 comes in under a year. So by mid-2020s, they predict it's gonna be at 3% of GDP. So that's a big hit to GDP, unless we continue to borrow yet more money. See, once you get into the compounding curve, where you're you know, woefully in debt, you basically have to take out more debt to pay your interest. However, we, we're, we've been doing that as a nation. Like that fourth quarter increase in national debt, it equates to $15,000 annually for every household in America. Median household income in America is $65,000. So this growth in national debt on an annual basis is like every household in America taking out three $5,000 limit credit cards and maxing them all out. It's not good. So we have a massive increase in debt, and I think the moment will come when investors say, you know, maybe if there's a recession, interest rates won't go down. Maybe they'll go down on a Pavlovian response, which they did in December, down to a, a level that I think is too low. But maybe then people will wake up and go, hey, we're looking at like drowning in treasury bonds. We could be looking at trillions and trillions of dollars of treasury bonds. We're already doing two trillion in a good economy. And it gets worse because the corporate bond market last year had some issuance, mostly to buy back stock, which is pretty risky because what you're doing is leveraging up your economy, corporate economy more and more and more. And you, you know, the, the, the equity is a residual piece. That's what, that's what you get when everybody else in front of you has been paid. So the smaller that gets against the debt, the more risky it is. It turns into what we call a residual. So we've had almost, there was borrowing for buybacks, but there were no maturities to speak of of corporate bonds last year in America. There were only 50 billion. For 2019, there's 700 billion. So let's add it up. One let's, let's, so let's say that the national debt ends up being higher than it's been running, because that's been the trend, so it's two trillion. 
And let's say that there's 700 billion of corporate bonds. That's 2.7. And let's say that there's 600 billion of QE. We're up to, you know, a lot, a lot. And so do you really want to own a 2.75 yielding 10-year treasury when you can buy a two-year treasury at 2.6? It just seems like a really bad idea. So I think the yield curve will, st will steepen out. Finally, there's one more thing to consider, and that is there is a huge underfunding in state and local pension systems across America. Every single state pension system is underfunded, and the average underfunding of state and local pension plans is 50%. Every yellow dot on here is each state. Look at Illinois. Their assets for the pension plan are 20% 20, 20 of whatever, and the liabilities are 75%. They're 60-ish percent underfunded. It's like hopeless. But all those yellow dots, like half of them are more than 25%. When you go to something called debtorg, debtclock.org on the internet, it's a fascinating set of panels. And it's, it's dizzying because it spins like a Tokyo taxi meter. And they, what they show is if you tally up all of the unfunded liabilities, state, federal, local, Medicaid, Medicare, Obamacare, Social Security, the United States total unfunded liabilities presently, and they're growing every second, is $122 trillion. Our gross domestic product is $20.7 trillion. So we have six years of GDP of unfunded liabilities. One way to think about that is if you wanted to get rid of it gradualistically, it would take you 60 years of investing 10% of your economy in funding these liabilities. It doesn't strike me as being very practical. Here's the thing I talked about. I actually did have the slide on the CBO projection. You can see how we're about one and a quarter now and how in just a few short years we skyrocket up to 3%. Last thing, corporate credit is really frightening. Corporate credit has exploded in recent years. This is the, per, the corporate credit as a percentage of US GDP. It's an all-time high. These are the maturities I talked about. See how there were none in 2018 to speak of. and how they, they go up. Junk bonds, not so bad. But there are more junk bonds than the world thinks. I have two more slides, this, one, this and one more. This is, uh, on the right-hand panel, is what we want to focus on. The dark blue area is the size of the investment grade corporate bond market. These are the supposedly good companies that are very likely to pay you back. You'll notice that before the crisis of 08, there were around $700 billion of corporate bonds. Now, there are $3 trillion of investment grade corporate bonds. The shaded light area is the high yield market. You'll notice that the high yield market now is very small compared to the investment grade bond market. It's actually the investment grade side is two and a half times as big as the junk bond side. However, the investment grade market is misrated, unfortunately. So this is, uh, this is hard to read, but it's a very important chart. I think it's my last one. What we have here on the right-hand panel, on the, on the left is the growth of the triple B part of the investment grade market. That's the weakest part. So bond ratings are triple A, double A, single A, triple B, all of the above are investment grade. Each one is sequentially viewed to be a weaker credit. Once you get to double B, it's now called speculative by old school parlance. That means that you're, a prudent person might not want it. It's got too high a degree of default. It's a speculative grade security. Well, let's look at the panel on the right. Triple A. Actual, if you look at the composition, literally, of the investment grade market, 4% of it has a AAA rating. A study by Morgan Stanley Research said if we use debt ratios alone, which is probably the most important metric of a corporate uh, creditworthiness, if we use debt ratios alone, they say none of the investment grade market would be AAA. So the four is, is a sham. They say that 6% actual is dull A, but only 3% should be by debt ratios. Of single A, 36% is actual, they say 19% should be single A, and of triple B, they say 54% actual, only 34 should be triple B. So 62% of the triple Bs, they say, are, you know, are, are uh, 62% should be what, they're, what they actually are rated. But the most important are the two on the right. What that says is that of all the investment grade bonds, triple A, double A, single A, and triple B, they say 30% 30, 30 should be rated double B. And 15% should actually be rated B, which means 45% of the investment grade bond market should be rated junk. 
per this Morgan Stanley study. Well, I've got some secret news for you. When bonds get downgraded, their prices go down. Their yields have to go up and their prices go down. So we could easily see a situation where these ratings get taken to the appropriate levels, particularly if the economy weakens and their corporate results have some deterioration, you could see 45%. What would happen? What would happen is you would have an en masse panic. I think that the corporate bond market today, the junk bond market, is in a similar position to what the mortgage securities market was in in 2007. It was misrated, and I remember when the bonds went down that had never gone below 100, they went down to 80, and people were cheering what a great buying opportunity it was. And it was for a while. They went back up to 94, but then they started dropping again. And what ends up happening when people do the buy the dip thing, and it's not really the bottom, is you have the first wave of selling that creates the dip, you have the relief rally, and then when the bottom gets taken out from the dip buying, the people that bought the dip turn in from buyers into scared sellers. So I remember when the mortgage bonds went from 100 to 80, people loved it, they thought it was a great idea, they bought them, they went up to 94, they ended, ended life at 20 on the bottom, 20. So I think that there's massive risk in the junk bond market and the triple B market, which is really the junk bond market that's unknown to be a junk bond market per the rating agencies. And the rating agencies acknowledge some of this as fact. But what they say is, we are not uh, taking the rating down even though the leverage is too high for the rating they have. And the reason we're doing that is we're hearing very reassuring talk from these companies. Well, it's reassuring talk because the rating agencies have sympathetic ears. And so they're saying, we will do something about this at a future date. We will do some debt, we'll do some asset sales, we'll, 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 we'll eat our broccoli in the future, you know, we're not just gonna gorge on, on peanuts and crackers, you know, but if the economy doesn't let them, or the market wakes up and says, I'm not gonna supply you this credit at that price, well, then they're gonna have to get downgraded. So I think, I, I, I've, I am wickedly negative on the triple B rated, um, and so I, I think that uh, it, it's interesting that while the economy is supposedly doing so well, and while there were hardly any, mature, any maturities in the corporate bond market, the investment grade corporate bond market did not have a good year. It was the worst performing sector of the investment grade bond market. If it's the worst performing sector during a good economy with low issuance, what's it likely to be under a weaker economy with boatloads of issuance? Thank you for your attention. We'll move to the next segment of our show today. Well, thank you, Albright Knox. Uh, thank you, uh, no, thank you, Jack Otter. Dow Jones, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for being here. Uh, and uh, Jeffrey, thank you for um, your knowledge, your generosity, and your uh, artistic uh, command. Uh, Jeffrey uh, is a connoisseur who, as a sideline, uh, buys low and sells high. That's <laughs> Jeffrey's story. Um, listening uh, to our tour guides today, I was uh, reminded of the, uh, the cycles of life, of cycles of art, and of perceived value. There was a, uh, an esteemed uh, devotional Spanish painter in the 17th century. His name was um, Murillo, Esteban Murillo, not to be confused with Oscar Murillo, who was a contemporary painter born in 1986, Oscar is, and who was, uh, made rather a splash, uh, kind of a seven-figure painter is Oscar, the modern one. now. Uh, the ancient Murillo, Esteban Murillo, uh, was the talk of Victorian England. His painting, The Immaculate Conception, in 1853, commanded a price of more than 24,000 pounds sterling. Now, that was in the gold standard, and 300 pounds was a very good annual income. So this painting, uh, commanded at a price of 24,000 pounds was the highest price of, uh, realized by a painting until the 1880s. 
Um, so then cycles turned, as they do, and uh, Esteban Murillo and his devotional work rather fell out of favor. And in 1950, uh, uh, Murillo's painting, uh, Christ Healing in the Paralytic, uh, was sold uh, for 8,000 fiat pounds sterling to the British National Gallery. Uh, it was scarcely worth writing the check. Um, something like the cyclicality in the perception of aesthetic value uh, certainly pertain in, in finance. Um, uh, scholars have observed something really interesting about interest rates. They tend to rise and fall in generation-length cycles or phases. Uh, the word cycle implies something predictable and scientific, but uh, I think that I can assure you from my experience that there ain't nothing predictable about finance, except Jeffrey's going to be interesting and the, as far as I'll go in the future. Um, the National Weather Service, ladies and gentlemen, employs, uh, I don't know, more than 4,000 people. Meteorology is a science. Uh, the National Weather Service performs 77 billion observations a year. Its computing power represents 10,000 times the power of the Dell on your desk. And wouldn't you know it, the National Weather Service sometimes blows it. Uh, there was a storm in New York City, a snowstorm, unscripted snowstorm in New York on November 15th. And the, the present, the unwanted and unpredicted presence of seven inches of snow during the evening commute set New York City on its ear. Now, Buffalo, do you have any sympathy for this story? <laughs> but that is the science of meteorology in action. It's an endeavor that has its ups and downs, but think of the size of the big data at the command of the National Weather Service and compare and contrast, please, the size of the data uh, available to our model makers of the Fed and compare the humility of the weathermen, they are humble people, with the swaggering certitude of the model makers of the Fed who insist there would be no mortgage crisis in 2008 and when it did happen, didn't actually recognize it in its presence in real time. Uh, the Fed is a human institution, I dare say journalism uh, resembles the Fed in that respect. Uh, we are in business to err. Um, uh, but knowing what we know about the future, which is to say the future is a closed book, we must proceed humbly. Now, uh, returning uh, for a few moments to interest rates before we uh, welcome questions from you, uh, the customers. Um, uh, interest rates have worked more or less in this fashion for more or less 150 years. They fell after the Civil War until about 1900. They rose from 1900 to 1920. They fell from 1920 to 46. And they rose from 1946 to 81. That was a 35-year ascent. Uh, they began at two and a quarter, and on the long bond, they ended at 15%. That was October 1981. And they fell from 1981 until July 6th. 2016, where uh, Jeffrey Gundlach made the Gundlach low. He declared that was it, and I dare say that is it now. Ladies and gentlemen, if the low on the 10-year security, which is a 1.138, 1, 132, 1.32 1 yield to maturity for a 10-year security in a currency nowhere defined at a time when inflation was ranging well over 1.32, if that were indeed the low, for interest rates, perhaps, just perhaps, we are looking at a generation length program of interest rate rises, increases. I, you know, it is a purely speculative hypothesis, but it's a way of thinking about the future. And uh, this speaks, the following point will speak a little bit to Jeffrey's observation on the state of the Treasury's finances. Uh, this year, I think, uh, to listen to Mr. Gunlock, the Treasury will issue, or the government will issue, either through the Fed dispositions or the Treasury outright issuance, the government will be responsible for injecting into the market 
the equivalent of securities that is unprecedented since 1945. That is the weight of supply in the treasury market. Uh, now, uh, the least profitable, least profit-making piece of information available to anyone in the bond market for the past 80 or 100 years has been, in general, has been uh, the Treasury's balance sheet. Uh, because when interest rates are falling, uh, the Treasury is a relatively small part. It's a bull market, and in a bull market, supply really doesn't count. But it might just be this time that because rates, shall we hypothesize, could be rising on a long-term basis that these new supply-demand dynamics of the Fed and the Treasury could be very meaningful. So all this sounds very gloomy, and indeed, I guess to some extent, we must face facts and not color them with hope. Um, but I want to say a few words uh, before I mention a couple of securities that will speak to Jack Otter's uh, well-intended slur on Jeff and me for being uh, nattering nabobs of negativism. <laughs> he meant no harm. But here is Benjamin Graham talking about the nature of bond investing. Quote, since the chief emphasis must be placed on avoidance of loss, bond selection is primarily a negative art. It is a process of exclusion and rejection rather than of search and acceptance. In common stock investment, the penalty for mistakenly, mistakenly rejection, rejecting an issue may be as great as that of mistakenly accepting it. But an investor may reject any number of good bonds and virtually no penalty at all will accrue provided he or she does not eventually accept an unsound issue. Hence, broadly speaking, there is no such thing as being un... Jack? There is no such thing as being unduly captious or exacting in the purchase of fixed value investments. So isn't this horrible, this news? But uh, uh, we have in the audience a very fine investor named Paul Isaac, and Paul Isaac is the son of a very fine investor and the nephew of a very fine investor. And what Paul Isaac has, uh, has uh, tried to get me to understand over the course of many decades is that, they quote, there's always something to do. Always in the interstices of the market, there are almost always things to be sold or bought. And I will leave you with a couple of names because after you paid good money to be here. Oh, actually, no way. No way. <laughs> well, then accept these ideas in the spirit of the price you paid. Um, is anyone here a resident of the tax paradise called New York State? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, two tickers, M-Y-N and E-N-X. They are uh, closed and New York municipal bond funds. They are selling, they're generalized now, they're selling at discounts to net asset value of 14%. They are lightly leveraged. They yield uh, about 4.5%. Um, and uh, they are at least purport to own uh, investment grade and high investment grade securities. MYN, that's the longer duration one, and ENX. So that's one. The second name I will leave you with before we welcome your questions is a, uh, an issue of General Electric preferred stock. The Series D is in Delta. There's 5.7 billion outstanding. Uh, but it's, uh, it's kind of over-the-counter-ish and somewhat recondite in that, or obscure in that respect. So you have to really have to tell your broker you actually are serious about this and don't hang up the phone. Uh, these securities are quoted at 83 and a half. The yield to the January 19, 2021 call is 14.7%. And thereafter, they, they yield uh, something, uh, a spread off of the London Interbank offered rate. And indications are that yield, if they are not called, will be uh, in excess of 8%. Now, Grant's interest rate observers had nothing to say good about General Electric since Thomas A. Edison ran the thing. <laughs> in fact, out of sheer authorial indulgence, self-indulgence, I'm going to read you a line or two or three we wrote about GE before I wind up with a bullish pitch on the security. This, this was, uh, we wrote this after GE skulked in onto the tape on a Friday afternoon one summer uh, some years ago and uh, paid a $50 million settlement to the SEC for uh, lying. <laughs> Here is Grant's interest rate observer. Uh, you know, uh, uh, 
the self-plagiarism and uh, self-parody um, neither intended the bugbears of the aging author or, as we learned to say, on the tour of the author. And uh, <coughs> let's see, uh, 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 Indian summer. <laughs> Nonetheless, here we are on GE. Financial historians someday will try to make sense of it all. A mere, the mere existence of a $100 billion GE commercial paper program the ideal of shareholder value carried to the point of alleged institutionalized fraud, an industrial company <clears throat> recreating itself as a highly and precariously leveraged financial institution with nearly a peep of protest from the stockholders, the close brush with insolvency of a company still bearing the imprimatur AAA. Finally, the historians of the future will scratch their heads to understand why Jack Welch and Alan Greenspan, icons of the late 20th century, put so much stock in an idealized stability that can only appear to exist in a dynamic world but can never be present in fact. Okay, that's GE. That's its moral squalor. <laughs> but here is the opportunity. These securities are money good, despite these bums. <laughs> Anyway, we, we think that, um, that GE has the asset coverage and indeed the earning power to make good on what is, I should emphasize, still uh, uh, in substance, if not in rating, a speculative great opportunity. It's a businessman's opportunity, the GE series D, 5%, perpetual preferred. So, um, uh, I don't know, you've heard from the best investor and you've heard from an aging journalist. I don't know, how about hearing from you? So I'm going to go over and sit by Jeffrey, and uh, we will welcome your questions. And afterwards, afterwards, we, do we have a, a student here who's going to hold forth? I we think we recruited a student from Canisius College. No, well, he's probably studying. Some of them do, right? <laughs> um, Jack Otter might here be here to uh, lead the questioning. But uh, we uh, afterwards, afterwards, Grant's interest rate observer is sponsoring a drinking contest. <laughs> <laughs> or. Uh, 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 a tasteful tasting of wine, I think, is, is, is the end. Uh, so, so please join us after. <laughs> I am still studying. Uh, the student is probably in a drinking contest right now. Uh, so someone will be coming around with microphones because even though your voice may carry, I believe this is being recorded or people across the auditorium might not hear you. So please wave, uh, put your hand up in the air for a microphone. Um, if you start raising hands, um, we'll get you a mic. But maybe, well, as long as you guys are, are both up here, I do have one question. Do you know of anything on which you disagree? I would love to hear if there is an, uh, an observation on the economy, perhaps it's serious well, I, I, will, I will ask this to, 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 to Jeffrey, uh, and, and that is, when I was listening to you, uh, 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 rapidly listening to you on these paintings, which I mostly did not understand, and, and listening to others describing the uh, levitation from $5,000 per to, uh, let us call it a quarter of a billion dollars, is that the modern art or is it the modern money? It's the modern way of moving money around so that your um, authoritarian government won't see it. That's it? I think that's a lot of it. The, the art market is actually much weaker than what you read in the newspapers at its core. The middle part of the so-called expensive art market, things that maybe fetched $2 million in 2007, is unchanged since that date. Well, maybe it's a little like uh, Esteban Morello. I mean, these, these yeah. artists come in in favor and then... Uh, yeah. Well, what people look at is the 450 million paid by the Saudis for a fake a Da Vinci. It was, it was offered, it's tellingly, it was offered in a contemporary art sale. Uh, the reason that they tongue in cheek Because they, they could paint it last year. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. In fact, in fact, the seller acknowledges that fully 90% of the painting was done in the last 10 years, but it's restoration, of course. But uh, it's highly suspect where that's even authentic. But um, then they talk about the Basquiat, which has truly levitated. That, that has a lot to do with shifting tastes and money due to fondness for diversity, uh, ethnicity, and things like that. Um, having no judgment on the merits or lack thereof of that, that I think that helps to drive 
certain pockets of the market. Um, and then, yeah, there, there are these flash in the pans that have enormous levitation. Uh, but what's driving the very high end of the market is the enormous wealth creation in, uh, in Russia and in China, where most of the buyers for these you know, leapfrogging uh, world records are new wealth with essentially infinite amounts of money. And so it uh, has a tremendous uh, tie into ego and desire for you to, to for these, these individuals to perceive that other people perceive them with envy. Any hands in the audience? I think I see one right there. Or two. Sounds like you got it. My Go question ahead. is, concerning global cash flows, what has been the impact on interest rates with the uh, uh, zero negative interest rate policies in Europe? And also, what do you speculate will be the uh, impact of the changing in uh, the ECB policies over the next uh, coming years? What will be the impact on our interest rates? Well, I don't think, contrary to what you hear in the media, I am quite certain that there is no factor that relates to negative interest rates in Europe that is keeping our, our rates low due to foreign buying. There is absolutely no incentive for a Japanese or European investor to buy our 10-year Treasury bonds, even though they yield substantially more than their domestic issues, because they would have to take the currency risk to do that. So the only safe way for them to own our Treasury bonds is to buy them and then hedge the currency risk. Once you adjust for the cost of hedging, the yields of our bonds are negative because the cost of hedging is so high. As regards zero interest rate policy, there does seem to be a strange tie-in, which is difficult to come up with a theory. It's one of these things that works great in practice, but what's the theory? You know, that's what the Fed likes to say. It works great in practice, but what's the theory on the things that they do? If you average the nominal GDP of the United States with the yield on the German tenure, you have an uncanny guidepost for the 10-year Treasury yield. Let's do the exercise right now. Nominal GDP in the United States was, is 5.5, but that's for the third quarter. We have a pretty good view of the fourth quarter because it's in the books except for some of the data from December. And we believe that it's sensible to expect a 5.2 nominal GDP. Uh, we, we have a GDP estimate from the Atlanta Fed, which is so far along that's probably likely to be nearly right of around 2.8 or something like that. And if we just assume that the inflation rate from the third quarter carries over, we will have 5.2 nominal GDP. The German 10-year closed last night at 27 basis points. So that takes you to 5.47 is the sum of those two. Dividing by two to create the average, you get 2.735. The 10-year Treasury today closed at 2.733. And it's been tracking with minimal error for years. It's not something that we data mine. It just happened to work. It's been working out of sample for a long time. I've, I've started to wonder why I bothered to even think anymore. Why does it work? Well, the old school idea was, uh, and this was supported by a lot of traditional economists, was that nominal GDP should be the guidepost for the 10-year Treasury. And I think the reason that that may have worked prior to the credit crisis was the 10-year Treasury rate in the United States and in Germany were nearly identical much of the time. So there was no need for this fudge factor. But it seems to me that there's something about, it may goes to that, what I believe is a non-economic um, competition argument, I'm not sure. But like I said, I'm not really sure what the cause and effect is, but it works remarkably well. It's, it's actually kind of shocking how well it works. There's another thing that works really well. And this one doesn't, this one has leads and lags much more than the other that I just referenced. And that's um, the ratio of the price of copper to the price of gold. Directionally, it's highly predictive of at least the direction of the 10 year treasury. For example, when the 10 year treasury was moving up above 3% earlier this year, the copper gold ratio was heading south. Copper was falling, and gold was finally beginning to rally and so that that ratio was going down. Um, and it suggested that we would have a move down in interest rates, and certainly, indeed, that was the case. 
it, further from this point, does suggest further dro drops in interest rates, but maybe copper goes up. I, I don't know. And there are leads and lags on that one. So um, what will happen when they change interest rate policy? Well, in Japan, they will never change policy, I don't think. It's just, it's never going to happen. They've been negative forever. Um, and they're 10 years negative, and they have such an outrageous amount of debt to GDP that uh, it's truly hopeless to try to pay that debt back. I, I think, you know, Donald Trump criticized Chairman Powell saying everything's great in the U.S. economy except for Jay Powell raising interest rates. And to a certain extent, I think Trump for once is right because Trump would love to see infinite amounts of debt at zero interest rates because at zero interest rates, you can have infinite amount of debt if you have an interest only perpetual <laughs> because your interest of zero is zero. I mean, if anybody wants to lend me money at negative interest rates, see me after the show. I'm, I'm there. I'll give you a dollar and you can send me more back later. Uh, uh, so uh, Japan, I don't think it's going to happen. I, I think in Europe, I, I think things are very bad. Uh, we see it from the European stock market just endlessly underperforming. You know what, what one stock to pay attention to, particularly I think, is, is Deutsche Bank. This is a, yes. It's a, such a well-known, I mean, it's, it's such a well-known and bankrupt obvious, company. It's <laughs> obvious. <laughs> um, uh, I'm not sure it's obviously insignificant. I'm surprised, actually, that it hasn't gotten more attention because. You know, here, OK, so you know, this is, it's now trading at 20% of book, implying that 80% of the book value of the bank is, is worthless. And right. it's, it's a trillion four, I think. They, they have a very funny logo. It's a, it's a square with a vertical dash in it. And I asked the CEO, I said, what's with the logo? <laughs> and he says, it, mean, it stands for rising in a constrained environment, as we said. But when Bank of America, <laughs> when we had our own banking crisis in a decade plus ago, it was when Bank of America went to a single digit price yeah. that all hell broke loose and they had to call in the fire trucks. There's something about the bank with your country's name on it going to penny stock land that causes concern. And Deutsche Bank, of course, seems to be in that position. They wanted to defend the price at 10, and they, they were, it, was, it was just kind of closing at 10 day after day after day. They finally could do it, and they started defending it at 8. And so now it dips below 8 briefly, and then it goes up to about 8.50. And they announced yesterday that they were going to uh, cut their bonus pool by some... What bonus pool? <laughs> <laughs> some, some large amount. So anyway, I, yes, Deutsche Bank is absolutely the security to watch. I I've, I've, couldn't agree more. So I, I think uh, if the ECB raises interest rates, the dollar will tank, if they ever have the courage to do it. The dollar will just tank. I mean, everybody thinks that the, the dollar is strong because the Fed has raised rates, the others haven't. So if that reverses, the opposite will happen. But the European stock market is already super weak on a relativistic basis. I mean, it's been a value trap for years. I, I wouldn't touch it with a barge hole. <laughs> you know? I said that about Amazon and Apple when I spoke at, to the students at Canisius College when Apple was basically on its high. Um, so I, I just think that the, if the, uh, they raise rates, their stock market is just doomed. The I, European Union will never work. It will never work. You cannot have these rules imposed by these mandarins in Brussels and Frankfurt imposed destroying the economies down south. They don't they have the common, common currency, but they have disparate fiscal policies. It doesn't, the whole thing is cockamamie scheme. I'm surprised it's lasted this long. Uh, we have a question in the front. Uh, Jeffrey, Jim, thank, thank you very much. And, and um, Jeffrey, regarding, uh, relating to what you talked about in Japan and Jim, what we've talked about before in boomerang bankruptcies, I'd like you to uh, comment on how you see the future that when there were bank, corporate bankruptcies in the past, there used to be a second chance. And now uh, the bankruptcy judges, Keith, uh, Keith Phillips at Toys R Us, Bob Drain, and from Topps uh, Friendly Markets to Sears, uh, let Wild Gottschaller, Kirkland, and Ellis take out $800 million a year in fees and impair what other would be, otherwise would be a viable, uh, viable companies. The consequences for the taxpayer, the government, and the uh, and the uh, public markets is that uh, you wind up having communities that 
half to three quarters of the operating budget is from sales tax, property tax, operating tax. That goes away. The taxpayers have to pay, pay the rest. And the people who survive are Amazon, Walmart, Wegmans, who have all been subsidized with government giveaways, so they're not paying taxes. And then you have the Taft Hartley plans and the defined benefit plans that the employers have to fully fund the downdraft in the bond market and the stock market. So CapEx gets taken away, reinvestment gets taken away, it accelerates recession. And with all that happening commercially from retail to manufacturing to IBM, how fast do you see a recession coming and what do you see are the consequences? Thank you. Well, I have developed a whole battery of economic indicators that I believe give us the potential for some visibility of recession. Um, some of them uh, are far away from predicting recession, but for the first time uh, in a couple of years, some of them are giving, I wouldn't say red light, but need to be watched carefully. The drop in the PMI on Friday uh, was one of the largest, it was the largest since 2008. If that drops further, I think uh, odds of recession within a year are significant. The spreads in the junk bond market were widening, but they really blew out in December to the levels that raise concern. Now, they've, they've calmed down in a way that's almost ridiculous since year end. I mean, this, the spreads are in by like 80 basis points. Um, so those charts are looking a lot less recessionary now. Um, the yield curve I, is, has a recessionary look to it. Um, but uh, most of these things are no longer at these all-time record and invincible type of readings, but they're not that distressing yet. So when I hear the people in financial media say, yeah, the market's down, so it's pricing in all kinds of bad stuff, it's pricing in less good stuff, but it's not bad stuff yet. To price in bad stuff, when these indicators are all off the highs but not yet into danger zone territory, that doesn't mean you're pricing in really bad stuff. It means that you will, will price in really bad stuff if these things deteriorate further. So I think the jury's really out now on uh, having a good feel for that recessionary um, prediction. But I think we'll have a much better idea in within two more months of reporting. So certainly we're overdue for a recession, but with what, what, what thing to think about. The national debt increased by 6% in fiscal 18. Nominal GDP was 5.5, right? Nominal GDP, the, 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 the national debt increased by 1.3 trillion. It wasn't 1.3, it increased by 1.3 trillion. That's 6% of GDP. Part of the GDP equation is the change in government activity. Without that increase in national debt, one could make the argument. We had a negative year. What's bailing us out is this Ponzi scheme of c continuing to respond to economic slowdown with stimulus. And then you, and it's so much stimulus, you know, that it shows up as some big number. And so the Fed raises rates. This is a suicide mission. We continue to issue more bonds and then voluntarily increase the cost of servicing those bonds. And so, and, and the short rates rising is really a problem because there's a lot of short term bonds. There are seven trillion treasuries maturing in the next five years and $10 trillion of global corporate bonds. So what those are rolled over at is going to matter. The average coupon on those seven trillion is two. What if it's four? Just to pick a number that's above today's levels. Well, that would be a $280 billion increase. Drop in the bucket, you say. Sadly, you're right. But, you know, you put enough drops in, you got a full bucket. <laughs> uh, are there any other hands? One over there? Yeah. I think uh, the eating and drinking begins in 17 minutes, according to my phone here. Try to keep this out of gas. <laughs> So I, I actually have two questions. So my first question um, relates to quantitative easing in the dollar, or quantitative tightening in the dollar. Uh, is there any chance that the tightening and the reduction of the Fed balance sheet, being a bank and reducing supply of dollars actually 
provides an artificial amount of support for the price of the dollar going forward? Might be something in that argument, but um, the dollar really peaked out when quantitative tightening started. I mean, the dollar really double topped. It, it, the top was really December of 2015, January 16, followed by a modest push to a new high, January of 17. So if, if what you're saying is right, the dollar would have been weaker. Uh, it's possible, what you're saying is possible. It, it's very difficult to draw conclusions on this stuff because we have a sample of one. You know, we've had, Jim talks about 3,000 years of interest rate history. We've never seen anything like this. So, you know, I, we've, we've seen other things before. You know, this is completely off topic, but I find it kind of comical. It, we used to have a half penny in the United States. I think Ben Franklin, who did everything, it seems, designed <laughs> the uh, half penny. And it was around until the 1860s, I believe it was, and there was an act of Congress abolishing it because it was worth so little, thanks to the, uh, I guess, inflation of things. Yeah, Civil War inflation. And so they abolished the half penny. The half penny then was worth more than a dime is today. And there was an act of Congress to eliminate the penny some years ago, it was, I think it was 15 years ago now, and it failed miserably, even though army bases overseas had abolished the penny sometime before that. And the logic for uh, not abolishing the penny was that it would be bad for poor people. Because, because yeah, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're the saviors of the poor because merchants would round up. So, like I say, weird things happen. Um, yet, but so there's precedent. We shouldn't have a penny, we shouldn't have a nickel. I mean, do you, does anybody keep the pennies? Does anybody? Okay, <laughs> do you want to have a collection or something? <laughs> I mean, I'm at the point where I don't, I don't take the nickels anymore. You know, but, um, but this negative interest rate thing we've never seen. We did see it on T-bills for like a week in 1932, I think it was, based on the it's in the Sinkefeld data. But I remember when I started in business, I was poring over this historical data, and I couldn't believe it. I was like, it was like negative four basis points or something. I was like, what an idiot would like buy this? Like, mattress looks good. But of course, what I didn't realize at the time is big commercial interests don't have a mattress big enough, so they have, they're forced, you know, so it's, they, they can do it as a, as a, essentially a capital preservation mode. But weird things happen, and it's hard to know. Um, you know, call, this, this enterprise of financial prognostication and explanation is very complicated, and it's often not clear what, what, the, what, people often confuse contemporaneousness with cause and effect. You know, it's like a person broke their arm and they won a hundred dollar lottery ticket, so now they break their arm every time they buy a lottery ticket. You know, I, they because hey, you know, they're pretty, but, so I don't know. I mean, maybe, maybe the, the, I, I think the opposite of your argument would make no sense. I, I, I'm not sure that, that that particular variable is terribly significant. So my, my second piece, um, if I if I may, one of the things that, that you've said is. No, have me with my own words. Okay. For your for your career, you're very interested to see how the, everything ends. So yeah, sure. Ends. Why not? I want to get people through it. Yeah, it, I got people through the the, the 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 credit crisis, which will not be called the great. You know, it was, it was the Great War in World War One, and then another one came, so we had to call it World War One instead of just the World War to end all wars. We're going to have Great Depression too. It's, we won't call it the Great Depression anymore. It'll be Do you have a date, Jeff? Um, yeah, no. Yeah, three years ago. <laughs> Something like that. No, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's um, yeah, it's, it's, un it's discouraging. But, um, but you got it. I figure that since I got everybody through the so-called Great Recession, I mean, 2008, my risky fund was up 20%. My competitors were all bankrupt. Um, I doubt I can pull that one again, but I'll try. Question over here. Um, we make a joke at our office that clients seem to know more about the car that they drive into the parking lot than the half a million dollars to a million dollars they have in their 401k plan. Yeah. And the amount of financial sophistication of your average American who's been pushed into using 401k plans is not very good. Yeah. Would you agree with that? 
Is there some way to get our government to help educate? Oh, no, people? please. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I say that tongue in cheek because. Um, uh, I, 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 think, I think that we see um, all kinds of bad behavior. I, I see. Anytime you have what I call herding behavior, it's really dangerous because everybody's moving in the same place and they'll all leave it at the same time. So I don't think, I don't think passive management's boom is helpful in any way. I don't think one size fits all robo advisors. I mean, look, you're, you're an advisor, right? When people come to you and you say, what's, you, what's your risk tolerance? Let me guess, <laughs> growth with safety. Right? They all want growth with safety, right? So everybody that signs up for one of these one size fits all, you put in your age, you're the same age as somebody your age, you put in your income, you have the same income as someone with your same income, your risk profile is the same as their risk profile, you're getting exactly the same thing. So in you go, and for a while it's a virtuous cycle. You know? That's passive investing is definitionally momentum investing. You're buying more and more of the stocks that have momentum to the upside, and you're buying less and less of the stocks that have momentum to the downside. It's definitionally momentum investing. So momentum investing is what passive is. So people bought the fangs, and then they went up, and then, then other things went down, but the fangs went up, so they bought more fangs, so they bought more fangs. Then Facebook, which claims to be this warm and fuzzy comfortable public space turns out to be a diabolical data mining monster. You know, suddenly, oh, there it is, Facebook, and they're gone, they're going, probably going to zero. And then you, have, then you have Twitter, you know, same problems. Then, and they're down at Amazon and Apple. That's what a top is made of. Every top begins with an insane mania, the tulip mania, for example, which is so famous. Do you know there's a building proposed in, um, London, that's the shape of a tulip. The stock exchange is it? Uh, should be. It's a 300-foot tower shaped like a tulip, the top tulip part is an observation deck in a restaurant. I suspect it will never see completion. Um, you know, then there was, let's just go back to OO, the dot-com thing, where you put dot-com on anything and it sold. I mean, there were plenty of IPOs floated by uh, businesses Maybe they didn't have a business plan, but certainly no sales, and obviously, therefore, no net revenue. Petfood.com, vitaminshop.com, and these IPOs were floated, and they multiplied in price within days. Well, what did we have last year? Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to a, to a trillion. Bitcoin this, Bitcoin that. You know, Bitcoin, I believe, is exactly the opposite of what the fans say it is. It's not an, an anonymous at all. It's the opposite of anonymous. It's the government tracking you. It's, it's their dream come true. So Bitcoin goes way up, and suddenly companies that are basically zombie operations decide that this is their chance to escape. So there was a company that we have all heard of that has now has acres and acres of empty parking lots in Rochester, New York, called Kodak. Kodak's market cap was at $100 million. That's it. Probably just the stub of their, of their pension plan. And Kodak announced last December or so that they were going to float Kodak coin, crypto. Now, $100 million is not going to get a coin off the ground, so it's just a pipe dream. The stock went up 400%. Then there was Long Island Iced Tea, a, uh, a money hemorrhaging beverage company. They changed their name to Long Island Blockchain saying, we are thinking about thinking about talking to people that we can't identify of doing a joint venture that regards blockchain technology. <laughs> and the stock went up four or five, six hundred percent. That's a mania. First, the mania crashes. Then one by one, the other things go. So then the New York Stock has changed. Then the, then the transports, then the utilities, then the Dow, then the S&P. And all the while, the world stock market is melting away. Bear markets everywhere, down 20, everywhere you look. Every rock you look under, you're down 20. And then the fangs give it up. So they got as high as they did because of the ignorance you're talking about, the hurting behavior I'm referencing, the algos. That's how a lot of financial media, when the market's down 800 points in two hours, it's no rational person would sell. This is just some, this is just some computer on haywire. Well, 
how did the prices get that high in the first place? No rational person was buying Facebook at 225. So it's a cycle, you know, you, 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 you learn in this business. I mean, eventually, if you pay attention, you learn by mistakes and by watching other people's mistakes. And so just to wrap up this anecdote, which has probably gone on too long anyway, it's what I call the big rock. You wait, I've decided I might actually get it right next time there's a blow off cycle. I won't be too early like I always am because I'll wait for the truly big rock, which is dot com, Bitcoin, those are the big rock. What's big rock mean? You're out down, you're down in the southern tier, there's no markings on the roads, you're driving along, you're maybe you're near Rock City down there, and someone says, Well, you go down this country road, it's not marked, go down the main road and turn left when you see the big rock. And I'm a mile on that road if you turn left. And he goes, you can't miss it. It's a big rock. You can't miss it. So you're driving along, and you go, whoa, look at that. It's like a 10 foot rock. It's a pretty big rock. You're like, mm, not sure that's the can't miss it type. So you keep driving. A few miles later, there's a like, rock the size of a house. And you go, oh man, that's the big rock. So left you go, and you go three miles, no house. So you go back to main road, drive along, and there's the rock the size of the moon. And you were like, that's the big rock. No doubt about it, sure enough, you're right. You get this, this thing that is so insane that I actually, my webcast that I did late last year was called Wacko Season because of the big rock. So these all things fit together, but um, I'm a bear. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was tempted to leave it there, but we have a question here. Yeah. Sorry, just as a uh, Canadian, I just wanted to say we abolished the penny a few years ago. Uh, my question is um, related to uh, total factor productivity and the decline in total factor productivity in the U.S. over the last 40 years, in fact, in the entire developed market uh, for the past 40 years, and the impacts for long-term interest rates uh, and the need to keep those low to support uh, the debt that's required to support living standards. Maybe Jim knows more about this productivity enigma than I do because I can't figure it out. It seems to me that with the rise of the machines, productivity per person should be exploding. I just don't get it how productivity can be in decline when we have so much leverage. I mean, there's these companies that produce widgets that used to have 120 floor, factory floor employees and now they have four people and they're producing the same amount of widgets. You're trying to tell me the produ productivity didn't go way up? I just don't understand. I think it's a residual. I, I, I don't really understand productivity that much. I don't think about it very much. But I kind of think it's like in, when you analyze an investment return series of an index or manager versus an index, they talk about alpha and beta. Beta is what your return was based upon the fact you were in that market. And alpha was this magic that you did or failed to do to get a different return in the market. But the alpha is simply a statistical residual. There's no definition of it. It's just what's left over. It's like savings rate. <laughs> yeah, like savings rate. You can't explain, mm. right? Uh, trying to grab alpha is like trying to hold water in your hand. So another mania that was out there, this was in 07. This was, this was the big rock in 07. Was um, uh, not 07. It was um, also before 00. It was a strategy that became wildly popular institutional. Another example of herding called Portable alpha. What people do is they say, I know, this guy had a higher return than the S&P 500 for the last five years and shows up as alpha. So what we're going to do is hire that guy, go long him, short the S&P, and leverage it 100 times. Because I get 100, and I've got no risk, because I've neutralized the beta, and I'm just going to be swimming in a, an infinity pool of alpha. <laughs> Blew up. It, it blew up before it really even got off the ground because it's just nonsense. So I don't understand the productivity thing. When you figure it out, send me an email. <laughs> uh, you've already asked a question, so I'm going to go to the man right there who has not yet. What do you see as being if, if we're going into a period that is this strange, with uh, a political system that is this sensitive to economic fluctuations, what do you see as the likely political policy response, and how will that both distort Socialism. things and affect your response to it as investors? Socialism. 
Um, we've, we've, we've gone over the tipping point where far more people receive money from the government than pay money into the government. And that's basically the death cross because once that happens, you're just going to have increasing dis, you know, disper, uh, disposition of money being uh, sent out. And you, know, you can see the rise of Bernie Sanders and now the Democratic Socialists. And New York City today announced that people that can't afford health care will be given it for free and they won't have to raise taxes to do it because there's this magic that we find inefficiencies in the way we're doing things. And so I think it's social. I, I was at the Barron's Roundtable. I, I do that every year. And every year they ask, the last question of the morning session is, what do you think we'll be talking about this time next year at the Roundtable? Same damn things. <laughs> Same damn things. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't my answer, but it's probably, but it, it's, for most of us, it it's, it's partially correct at least. But I said, we'll be saying that there are actually more than two viable, can, two parties running with candidates and it looks quite possible that the next president will be decided by the Congress because no, no one of them will win the Electoral College. This from the guy that predicted Trump would win January 6th of 2016. So I, I, I think it's obviously socialism. But here's, a, here's a question for you as a, as a, as a bond guy, Jeff. I mean, you are on record as saying that you have never sold short at U.S. Treasury Security, nor would you ever suggest to anyone that he or she do that. A bond is a promise to pay money, right? What is money? What is money today? And what is it likely to be under the collectivist regime you seem to anticipate so sooner rather than later? And if? I think it'll be um, great quantities of money, of fiat money, that, so it's just worth less, I think. Well, here's, here's, here's another problem with the bond market, it seems to me. Uh, uh, Today's yields are not unprecedented. Uh, we had them in the 50s. We had certainly had them in the financial repression of the World War II years. Had them in the 19th century. But in days gone by, until the time of William McChesney Martin, really, who was a Fed uh, chairman in the, uh, in the 50s and the 60s, there were periods of very low or negative CPI changes that compensated a creditor for the cycles in which the value of money deteriorated. Right. So there, there was deflation as well as inflation, especially in the 19th century. Now the Fed is, uh, has got it into its own head. It calls it its, its, uh, its mandate, mm. but it's not really a congressional mandate. It's the Fed's decision never to, if it can help it, let inflation get below 2%. So the, the consequence, we have, we have a treasury yield curve, that is to say the spectrum of yields from three months to 30 years in which after tax and after inflation, nobody's making anything. Right? right. And yet, notice the complacency or the, sanguin uh, the sanguineness of the creditors of the world in the face of these things. In France, in France, you have to go to 30 years before you find a real yield. That real yield is 10 basis points. And in France, uh, you can smell uh, tear gas all the time. So what does it take to rattle creditors such that they ask the question, what is the money in which we hope to be repaid, and why are we settling for yields such as they are, without the hope of a decline in the level of prices that would make those uh, returns uh, yeah. something I, I, you, The points are all valid. I, what, I, what I've experienced is that people will continue to repeat what they're told to think until such time as it's just no longer possible to believe in it anymore. Now, I, I, when I started in the business, I created a bond strategy that I believed mathematically could be proven to be superior to a bond indexation program. And um, I can still prove it. So I went around to consulting firms and I thought, if I show them this proof, I'm gonna like be booming in business and They'll be jumping over the table, take a number to sign up as a client. But I was wrong. I, I, uh, I would go and I would go and they'd I'd talk to their analyst named Susie, who just graduated from Brandeis last May. And I would show her and she would just ask me these routine questions, not even listen to me, and put a file in the drawer. And I would try to get it to a higher level. And I always thought that someone would go, aha, this is great. But instead, they looked at me like a deer in the headlights, 
terror because it was different than what they'd been told. And I, I was like, what, what's wrong with these people? Well, the problem was that I like figuring stuff out. And most people don't. I learned that after about 20 years. They like to be told what to think. So they will continue to repeat this kind of emperor's new clothes type of thesis until such time as it just collapses, and it collapses incredibly quickly, like the belief in the rating agencies was when it was blatant that what they were doing was wrong. So I think that these, when you have, have concepts that you outline which make all the sense in the world, but are not being acted upon, it's sort of like these, I, the, the financial world is a game of Jenga. And the pieces are coming out of the foundation. There's no reason for anybody to be taking this make no money approach. But the game goes on until the whole structure collapses. And I think the scales will fall from people's eyes pretty quickly. And you will see a rout in this activity that is so frustrating for you and I to observe. And what, out in what, and how, how it'll play out, what markets, or what? I just think you'll have an awareness that you've created a situation that needs to be monetized away through inflation, money printing, or default. So that's like bearish for treasuries, right? It either means that your purchasing power is very poor, or you're going to get back less than you put in. So, ha, they pulled a good trick. They gave you negative interest rates, and you didn't even know it. Uh, on that note, I'm going to take moderators, um, uh, whatever you would call it, and ask you a question, Jeff. I know you are not bullish on nickels. You're not bullish on Bitcoin. You're not bullish on... No, oh, I, I am. I'm actually a short-term Bitcoin bull. Ah, the, the mania, Blue not. Blue not. the greater fool theory? I, no, I think it's fallen so far and it's stabilized to a point that it's at 4,000. And it just seems likely to me that it'll hit 5,000 on randomness. That's a 25% gain. Okay. I, don't th I think that's your best way, highest probability way of getting 25% this year. <laughs> but uh, it's not like I'd hold on to it. You gotta be disciplined. You know, you, you just sell it 5,000 and, and declare victory. Uh, for people who might do that in a small section yeah, of their portfolio. With, don't do this with your nest egg. Uh, with nest egg money. Um, I'm not going to do it for a penny. I, it, it, I don't want to be the, the fool that owns this thing. But if you're a Bitcoin type person and, you, and you know, you've been probably disappointed unless you bought it at 1000 then, uh, you know, take a shot. Without taking fire from, from Barron's uh, Saturday issue, is there anything that you would like to recommend now? Anything that, that does seem like a good opportunity out there? You know, it was funny, but um, I just said, you know what, really, uh, I'll repeat what clients have asked me recently. Not so much in the last couple of months, but when yields were really uh, low, which they still are, and yield curve is flat, so there's no advantage to taking maturity risk and the incremental premium you got from corporate bonds was pathetically low, even lower than people realize because they're calling it triple B when it shouldn't be, so it's even a narrower spread. People come in and say, why should I buy some fund like yours? I mean, it's like, why don't I just buy the two-year treasury? And I said, I, I think you're right. So one guy on the panel recommended the two-year treasury, and I said, you know, that's funny because I recommend one of my recommendations is the Vanguard short-term bond fund, one to four year maturity, I mean, whatever. It isn't like you're gonna make a lot of money on it. But at least you will, if rates fall, you will at least not lose money. Well, you'll be losing your shirt in the stock market and the corporate bond market if rates fall from here. And if rates go up, hey, you can roll them over because they're short-term maturities and hopefully, you know, you'll, maybe one day you'll get a real yield on it. Those. But the other things I did, you can probably tell uh, that I'm bullish on the relative value of emerging markets. Right. So EEM is ETF for emerging markets. My pick last year for stocks was Brazilian stock market. Looked like a real loser at mid-year, but it's actually one of the best stock markets for the entire year. It closed up. Uh, well, on that happy note, because um, you guys gave me one. If I waited for the next one, we'd be here till 8 o'clock. It, it's, it's a treat to listen to one of you speak. 
uh, but to have two of you in the same room uh, has really been wonderful and made up for the Bills season more, uh, more than even the Jets season. Uh, thank you, Jim Grant. Thank you, Jeffrey Goodlock. Thank you all. Uh, we will be downstairs. <laughs>